Happy Friday, Baylor College of Medicine and friends of Baylor. Well, Lily's back from Greece. She's all dressed up and ready to go to school. So we're very excited to have her back. I don't know what it did with her on vacation, but it's terrible. And by the way, uh, and this is for my sister. My sister's always complained that, um, you know, she when she goes to the doctor, she never feels like she's smart enough or saying the right words. Uh, and I and, and she's usually right, by the way. But so uh, I hurt my back, and so I went to the physician yesterday as a patient, and the doctor said, uh, "What can I what can I help you with? What's what's your problem?" And I said, "I did something to my back." <laughs> very very technical. It's a highly medical tra trained person, 45 years of medicine, and all I can say is I did something to my back. All right. So Janet, don't feel bad. Anyway, uh, last stuff to catch on, uh, catch up about, and catch on too, but catch up. Uh, let's talk about COVID. I usually start off with uh, the data, but I had a couple of things that I wanted to talk about first. Interesting uh, study that looked at whether or not the vaccine mandates actually improved compliance with vaccines. And the answer is yes and no, of course. So uh, this is a study that looked at just healthcare workers who are already pretty compliant around vaccines and looked at what happened to the states where mandates were uh, put in place. And in those states where mandates were put in place, and there were no exceptions, so you couldn't have a religious or uh, a medical exception, they went up 3.5%. Okay, so it doesn't seem like a lot, but they started off high. So, you know, it was about 82% for healthcare workers, it went up to 85 and a half, 86%. In the states where there were ways to opt out, like religious exceptions or medical exceptions, there was no change. And it really didn't have, unfortunately, it didn't have much of an impact on the rest of the country, but so mandates sort of did, mandates can work if you say you, there's no exceptions, but if you have exceptions, then people who don't want to get vaccinated still figure out ways not to. And of course, I don't like to start with the stupidest news on earth, but there is the stupidest thing I've ever heard of. NASA County Executive, uh, Bruce Blakeman, put his signature on the first in the nation law, banning face masks with the exception for religious and health reasons. So that's a, that, that to me, so if you, if you wear a burqa, I guess you're okay. Or if you have a reason, medical reason to wear, which I thought walking around with a face mask is a medical reason, but it's been banned. Why do they say? Because those who target hate crimes while wearing face coverings can't be identified. I mean, really, that's... <laughs> Nassau County is where my, my in-laws are from, so I, you know, I know about Nassau County and on Long Island, and I, I don't know what they're doing there. Now, an interesting study from Europe looking at the impact of vaccines. And they looked to see, uh, you know, all of the European, 34 of 54 countries, they looked at the coverage of vaccines, actually much higher than in the U.S., about 87% compliance with the primary vaccine, 82% for the second dose. It's fallen off like 70% for the first booster and very little, like 24 for the second, 5% for the third. But when they looked at pre and post vaccine, they estimate that 1.6 million European lives were saved, which is pretty impressive. And I think people forget vaccines saved a lot of people's lives. Uh, in the European Union, there were a total of 2.2 million deaths. And just to put that in context, in the United States there were 1.2 million. So a lot of people died and vaccines were very effective at preventing them. So please, as the surge comes uh, this fall, get your vaccine. Then there was an interesting study looking at long COVID, and one of the interesting things that came out of this one study was that, that postmenopausal women seemed to have a higher incidence of long COVID. 34% had symptoms that lasted for eight weeks. Don't know why, just is, probably age-related. Uh, and there was a two-year study that showed uh, that long COVID has fallen from 84 to 61% from year one to year two, uh, showing that the, I think we know that the virus itself has evolved and has become less severe. So that's a good thing. Now, on to the COVID data. So big surge, big surge. 18% uh, up in tests, 2.4% uh, up in uh, emergency room visits, 3.3 uh, per 100,000 increase in hospitalizations and increasing deaths. If you look at wastewater data, the peak here is almost what it was last winter. JN1, this is the peak for JN1. That's the peak for Omicron. So it looks like the flirt in ver uh, variants are going to continue to surge. And my guess, we will have at least as many cases by the, by the winter as we had with uh, last year in JN1. If you look at the wastewater analysis across the country, 
Red dots show increasing, and you can see it is all over. It's not like in one region or the other. This, to me, really suggests that what's happened is we have waning immunity from last year's infection, and the changes in the virus are sufficiently uh, different enough to, to uh, evade uh, our immune response, and so we're getting a big resurgence. Uh, and we will see this continue through the, uh, I think, till, through the winter. And so as soon as the vaccines are available, I strongly recommend you get vaccines to the current strain. It's turning out to be very much like flu. Our resistance wanes, a new uh, version appears, and we have another uh, big surge in cases. The main variants are uh, what we call flirtin variants. I've talked about that very many times. There's two substitutions in the uh, spike protein. I want to bring your attention to this purple thing. That's JN1. That was last year's. It's virtually disappeared. It's all now the new flirt variants. And why is that important? If you look at the traveler surveillance program, which is all the flights in the eight airports that are looking at it, wastewater from airplanes and airports, you can see a big surge. But if you look at sequencing of those, there's still a lot of JN1, that's the purple, which again suggests that most of the evolution is happening in the U.S. and the Europe and other places in the world are sort of lagging behind us. Not in a good way, by the way, not in a good way. So what's new out there? <laughs> what else can kill us? <laughs> well, there's a big alert for parvovirus 19. So the CDC uh, is been urging physicians to be uh, highly alert to, to parvo 19. Uh, this is commonly known as fifth disease. You might ask, <laughs> why is it the fifth disease? Well, it was described as a fifth disease with kids with fever and rash, and the other illnesses were measles, rubella, chickenpox, roseola, and my favorite, Duke's disease. This was actually not Duke University, but Clement Duke, mm -hmm. who described it in England around uh, eight, the late 1880s. And that is uh, caused by staph, actually, scalded skin syndrome, or what we know as the fourth disease. Now, that's something my sister can understand. <laughs> fourth disease, fifth disease. Anyway, uh, it's, it's, they, fifth disease is commonly called slap cheek disease because kids present with these bright red cheeks. That usually happens after they've been infectious. So what happens is people get infected. Uh, it, it incubates for one to three weeks. Uh, at two or three weeks into the infection, uh, they're no longer contagious, and kids break out in this uh, rash, this rash in their cheeks. Sometimes they have joint symptoms, fevers, things like that. Uh, can be infected, adults can be infected, particularly pregnant women are, are at risk. Uh, and what's interesting is we've been, the CDC has been following recent respiratory infections and uh, diseases of respiratory infection with rash. It was only 15% of parvo cases, now 40%. So most, almost half of the cases that are being seen now with fever and a rash are or this uh, parvo-19. So that's something for physicians to be aware of. Uh, it's a very common disease in, in childhood. But it's important that uh, physicians be aware of that. Uh, the same thing is happening in Europe. So Europe has also had uh, a surge in 14 different countries. That was my favorite, Mpox, it never goes away. Mpox is really bad this year. It's killed uh, 548 people in the uh, DRC in Congo, in the Congo. There are also cases along the border in countries that are linked to, to uh, DRC. Pakistan now has 11 cases with one death, and Sweden has reported one case. And so it's, uh, it's a, it is a big problem for the World Health Organization. has had a big alert for our physicians to be aware. The Congo is finally going to get vaccines. They need about 3 million doses of vaccines to cover their country. And most of the vaccines are in the U.S. and Japan, so we will be donating those vaccines to help the spread. Then there was an interesting study I thought you'd all be interested. Lily asked me in particular, can, she wants to know, <laughs> can pox be spread to, to uh, animals, spread to animals, pets in particular? So the last outbreak in 2022 was not so severe, but it was in many people in the United States, looked at uh, five different people's uh, homes that went in and swabbed the environment and their pets. And what they found was that by PCR, you could find both on pets, 12% of animals and 25% of envir environmental swabs are positive for mpox. But that's only by the DNA. It was not infectious. They couldn't find infectious virus. And when they looked at the animals, none of them developed antibody response, so they were not infected. So the, vi the pi virus was on surfaces but didn't infect people. So <laughs> Lily feels safe. We don't seem to be able 
able to spread it to uh, domestic animals. It's relevant because it's a zoonosis in Africa. It comes somehow from rodents and other animals, monkeys, to humans. Uh, probably thought to be respiratory, not exactly clear how the transmission works. So it is reasonable to think that if it comes from animals to man, it might be that animals can transmit it back to, uh, and humans can tra transmit it back to animals, but not to domestic animals, at least we don't know. So what's new in bird flu? Okay, you, <laughs> it never ends. Uh, we're expanding testing for bird flu in, uh, in dairy cattle meat. Not, before it was just milk from dairy cattle, but some of the dairy cattle end up as beef. And so they're now testing to see whether or not it can be transmitted through beef. There's no evidence that it can. There's also uh, looking at whether or not it can be inactivated by just aging. So like in raw milk, cheeses, for example. So there, there's testing going on. There's no, we don't know yet, actually. Uh, we know that it can be transmitted to people and animals uh, in raw milk that's recently been uh, uh, taken from infected uh, animals. Pasteurization gets rid of it. We don't know whether or not how long it's sustained, and we don't know whether it can be passed off in cheese. I, I think it's unlikely, but th that is a big concern, and people are looking. Colorado just reported six cases in domestic cats. So two domestic cats, uh, two of them were listed as indoor cats. Not really clear how they got infected, probably from an infected bird. That's the most likely, uh, but obviously it's a concern. Anytime other mammal species are getting infected, we start to bring cannot spread between humans. Uh, and there's a lot of concern internationally. So uh, ecologists are warning that, uh, that H5N1 birds who flying from Antarctica to Australia may very well expose their population, so they're testing. India has a very large duck population, and they're beginning to screen all their, their ducks. And France has now reported one poultry farm that has H5N1. So again, this continues to be a, a worldwide problem. We're all pro you know, worried about it, and we'll hopefully we'll be prepared if it ever jumps to humans and becomes a global pandemic. So, uh, I want to end today with a bunch of shout outs. First shout out I'm going to give is to uh, Dr. Paul Paley in the Department of Physical Medicine and Rehab, who, <laughs> if it weren't for him, I wouldn't be standing in front of you today. Yesterday I was on my back, uh, immobile. Uh, maybe many of you would prefer it that way. Uh, in, I also want to congratulate Dr. Keila Lopez, Associate Professor of Pediatrics, who has been selected as the American Academy of Pedi Pediatrics 2024 Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion Excellence Award winner. This was established to recognize excellence in advancing equity, diversity, and inclusion in pediatric medicine. So congratulations to her. Big shout out to Drs. Angela Cortez, Gabriel Nguyen, and Michael Lee in Baylor's H. Bentow Department of Physical Medicine and Rehab. They're caring for athletes at the Paralympic Games in Paris at the end of this month. And as we saw in the Olympics earlier this month, uh, they, uh, the athletes often need medical attention. We talked about Mr. Niles, uh, Lyles last week. Uh, also, a shout out to Baylor Orthopedic Surgeons, Melvin Harrington, Jack Dawson, and Bill Granberry, who recently returned from one week visit to Guatemala to provide surgical care for patients through the Faith and Practice Charity Organization. All three have been making this yearly trip uh, to Guatemala for over a decade to care for patients with orthopedic needs. And then finally, a big shout out to the middle school teachers from Baylor College of Medicine Academy at James D. Ryan Middle School and the Baylor College of Medicine Biotech Academy at Russ Middle School, who spent time in our Huffington Center for Educational Outreach participating in our STEM plus M focused professional development school for the beginning year. Teachers heard from Baylor research and education leaders, participated in hands-on STEM demonstrations, and had a session of science writing. I hope you found a lot great information to take to you. Our, our schools are outstanding and we are very committed to uh, working with our teachers in those schools. So anyway, have a great weekend and I can't wait to see you next week.